my idea was to try to get the island on board a little bit with some of the stuff that I've been doing nationally. And it's hard for people to get their head around the subject of environmental health and environmental medicine. But um, behind Adam, actually, there's a poster that's um, from a talk I just gave at the branch of NIH called the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences in Triangle Park. And it was on obesity, electrosensitivity, mycotoxicosis, and the clinical practice of environmental medicine. And in the handout, I think I Xeroxed a page where it said that environmental medicine shows promise for treating chronic disease. So it was kind of a landmark moment when they had an environmental medicine physician speak there and also discuss um, how useful they thought our techniques would be in treating things like insulin resistance, diabetes, um, mental illness, and I discussed opiate addiction at the meeting as well. So lately, the subject of opiate addiction has been big in the media and on the island. And we've had meetings, we've had um, you know, the documentary that, that was about opiate addiction. And I've been speaking about this, as I did on MVTV, I gave a presentation uh, last February about the issue with alcoholism on the island and why people are gravitating towards drugs and alcohol. And one of the reasons may be, oh, come on in. We just started five seconds ago. Yeah. Is, are you Matt? I am Matt. Nice to meet you. Hi. I'm Lisa Nash. Hi, and this Hi, is Ray. He's from Gosnell. Yeah, and this is the CEO of the hospital. Yeah. And this is Victoria. Yeah. Oh, and this is your glass of water. Glass yeah. of water. Sure, thank you. And then, did you have my hand up? Can I pull it in for a second? Here you go. Okay. I mentioned I'm videotaping it for posterity, my talk, and then if somebody doesn't want to be filmed, they can sit over here out of sight. Um, or if they want to make a statement, they can just go like this, we'll turn off the camera. So I was just mentioning that I gave a talk in the government, and I, I have also done some talks in Congress on veterans' health, and um, some of them have gone really well. So I'm going to use a PowerPoint to just discuss a couple of the points and remind me kind of what the interesting highlights are. But I won't be going into great deal about you know any one subject because we don't have too much time today. Um, the handout is the first thing I want to go over. So it says that there's an intro and a PowerPoint, and I'm going to discuss damage to the autonomic nervous system and the adrenal gland and chemical sensitivity and the relationship of these exposures to alcohol and stimulant use, such as caffeine, nicotine, Adderall, cocaine, and using prescriptions or by addiction to street drugs. Adrenal compromise from mold exposure has been proven in animals. So the Army did a study on mycotoxins and proved that the rats die if they're in a moldy environment, but only the female rats, and they die from adrenal necrosis. So if you gave female rats an injection of testosterone, they live. So that's why males, not necessarily just rats, but males in a home will respond differently than females due to mold exposure or producing mycotoxins. They just can't handle the stress and they actually die much earlier, the females. Um, also, adrenal insufficiency is not the only problem we see from chemical or mold exposure. We see this dysautonomia issue. So dysautonomia, has to do with the blood pooling in your legs. And it makes you want to cross your arms and shift because you can't feel comfortable because all the blood is down in the bottom half of your body. And you can feel kind of anxious because your heart's empty and you're not perfusing the top part of your brain, basically, and you get foggy thinking. And so a lot of people will get chest discomfort, panic attack, release adrenaline, and they'll beat fast. All they have to do is sit down or raise their legs up or have salt and water, or st stockings, constriction pantyhose. So we see how many people in society probably have this. Most thin women cross their legs, if not pretzel their legs. So this is a very common phenomenon that's been researched um, in many different areas. So one of those areas is addiction. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about some cases I've seen in the past year. One case on the vineyard is an 18-year-old boy who is so fatigued he can't go to school. He has exaggerated tachycardia at Beth Israel Hospital when he has a tilt table test. And the tilt table, they just tilt you like this with your head up and the blood rushes down to your legs. 
and then the heart goes fast, and you could faint. Some people will have a fainting spell, and other people will just feel anxious. So this boy did four vitamin IV drips, and then he had an episode where he looked manic, an episode where he looked depressed, and later the family has opted out for psychiatric drugs as opposed to continuing treatment. But this is a short-term fix, and it doesn't really resolve the true problem, that he probably has mold exposure from home or school or work and his mold toxins were high in his urine. Case two is a 20-year-old girl. She was tested by saliva about a decade earlier and had adrenal failure. Nothing was done, no referral to the endocrinologist. She ended up starting to drink alcohol a lot and then ended up as an opiate addict and has not been able to work for the last 10 years. So now she was found be better when she was treated with hydrocortisone, this treatment for Addison's disease. And she is very good at describing her experience of using narcotics to medicate the adrenal failure and how you feel normal when you take the painkillers. And that's how people with adrenal failure would find out what's missing, is that by some <coughs> fluke, somebody gives them a drug. The other drug you could get would be a steroid for a rash or something. So this patient had a steroid injection for a rash, felt cured for days, and then ended up stealing steroids from hospitals in order to medicate the Addison's disease that was not being treated. So it's not just that people want to use opiates, but they'll use whatever drug fixes their symptom. And my premise is that cocaine and nicotine and other things that vasoconstrict are treating this dysautonomia and it's rampant in society and really on the island. And all we have to do is check the standing heart rate and we'll know what it is and who's got dysautonomia. Uh, case three is a young male from Martha's Vineyard with a standing heart rate of 140. A normal heart rate is 72. He's anxious, acts <coughs> crazy, he's, he, he steals to get drugs, he's on Suboxone, and he's in the hospital in and out of McLean they don't follow through on his Addison's diagnosis or his POTS treatment, and um, they won't respond to calls to ask for a tilt table. But the child has been there, I would say, six months out of the past three years. There's another 18-year-old with a heart rate of 130 positive for Addison's. And as soon as he went on treatment, he was better and able to get off drugs. Case five is a teacher made ill at a school, becomes disabled and too sensitive to mold to return to work. She sweats abnormally and has a positive tilt table test. These are real people. Case six is a teacher at a school who had a tilt table test, unknown etiology of why he was having postural tachycardia. And on the tilt table, the heart rate goes to 10. Blood pressure drops to 40 over 20. He passes out and almost arrests. So in order to make sure that never happens again, we may put a pacemaker in the patient. Uh, a very sad case of a family of four came from Florida, made ill by stachybotrys in an apartment. The mother and son came for help, and a few days later, two more children came for help. The entire family has adrenal failure, dysautonomia, immune damage, and high mycotoxins. They leave in search of media attention. The eldest boy kills himself at age 17, unable to believe that mold has made them sick, as no doctors believe what has happened to them. The last two are kind of notable people. Mary Kennedy redid her house for mold and wrote a book and did a movie about it. Her kids became food allergic, I hear. She drank a bit and was arrested for drink, drinking on a Sunday at noon. She soon hung herself. Kitty Dukakis, which I spelled wrong, uh, met with me years ago and discussed depression and electroshock therapy and how moldy her basement was. And I explained that indoor toxigenic mold leads to depression and has been proven to do so. But electroshock therapy won't fix the mold in the basement. Okay, so that's uh, just the points I wanted to get across how profound the subject matter is. And then I will, let's see. There were, people come here for treatment from around the country and I would say 75% of the cases are related to mold exposure. Many are disabled and intolerant of chemicals after this mold exposure, and 30% are intolerant of EMF, which means when they hold the cell phone, it heats up in their hand, or they're near a computer or a big TV, they don't feel good. They may get chest pain. 
This is acknowledged by the government, and this is the discussion we had in this meeting at NIEHS just a few weeks ago. In fact, at NIEHS, they've now proven in a $25 million study that cell phones do cause cancer in rats, more so in males. So now they're much more interested in EMF and the non-thermal effects of radiation, including why not to wear the cell phone on the body. The issue in the school here is that Wi-Fi, industrial Wi-Fi, if we have it in the school, I'm not aware, can be a problem for children and leads to tachycardia. Then if you add it on top of maybe having mold in their home or mold in a classroom, they cannot handle the burden of all of these things at once, and they will start to get more symptoms more quickly. I've been lecturing at the Lyme meeting and explaining not everything is Lyme, but mold patients have a damaged immune system and may end up getting Lyme and needing treatment for both, but not just long-term antibiotics, because sensitive patients don't do well with antibiotics for a prolonged period. Okay, I'm just going to play this video because I think it says a lot, and video is much more interesting than I am. So we'll see if I can. This is Lisa Naj. This is a patient who has come for treatment for the past week and wanted to give a testimonial for our U.S. congressman and other people to hear about. Hi, my name is Jeremy. Uh, just want to let you know uh, I came down here with uh, tremendous anxiety, a dependence on cigarettes. Uh, I was very anxious. Uh, I work in the natural gas industry. I own a business in the natural gas industry and um, became very ill over the last 10 years. Um, now, after having five days of treatment here, um, I, most of my symptoms are completely gone. Um, I feel so much better. The nervousness, the anxiety, the depression, it's gone, it's lifted. Um, I find that uh, the treatment here has really helped with uh, my positive outlook on life and it's lifted the veil that I had over my life is completely gone. Um, so I think that if whoever's out there listening to this, I think this would benefit anybody who's had exposure to any type of chemicals in their life, um, any types of uh, molds, um, anything like that, would, they would benefit from this treatment. And uh, uh, natural gas, the way we found out that natural gas was a problem is because we skin tested and did an injection of it and I experienced all the symptoms I've been experiencing for the last 10 years. Uh, came out at once and it was uh, it was very enlightening. I have one thought. Uh, we talked about having environmental exposure lead to problems with the autonomic nervous system and with the adrenal gland. And you've been treated for both of these problems with midadrine and also the hormone Cortef. And it may be hard to tell which thing is doing what, but do you feel that that treatment has been helpful for stabilizing uh, your heart rate and your blood pressure and making you think more clearly? Uh, definitely, that's helped uh, tremendously. Um, my heart rate has stabilized. As I said before I came down here, I was very uptight. Um, and everything has just kind of leveled off. I'm calmer now. Yeah. Um, and my head space is very clear. But it hasn't been like that for 10 years. And I think this would be helpful for veterans because they have such a mixed picture of exposures and of uh, symptomatology that we're trying to explain this would benefit all of them. I think one more point we should um, uh, lay out here is that I was, about five years ago, I was on my way to a psych ward. Um, that's how bipolar and mania, yeah. I had all of the issues, mental issues. Um, and now you feel pretty balanced. And now I feel very balanced and I'm going back to work. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, thank you very much and uh, good luck. Thank you. So I thought it was pretty, I mean, this was a guy who um, was just in the driveway on the way out the door and said, I'm going to Congress. And he said, oh, let me give you a testimonial to take. And I showed it at the Veterans Health Subcommittee um, to Congresswoman Brownlee and um, a, a few other of the big players at the Institute of Medicine and at the VA, the lead researcher from the VA was there. And apparently, uh, one of the lead researchers at the VA liked my message and got uh, me to speak via Skype on dysautonomia in veterans. And there was $100 million of research money and he's taken it and put it all towards environmental exposure and collecting data on 
whether it's mold, chemical, other exposures that veterans have had, and trying to figure out how to detoxify them and treat them for the dysautonomia without an expert. You could really have a general practitioner do this kind of treatment, and it's easy to train physicians how to look out for these symptoms. Okay, let's see. Okay, so this meeting is not about my practice. Before I started working, I did a lot of uh, help, a couple thousand families. I ran a nonprofit. People would call me and say, where do I go? I'd refer, refer them to physicians in the country that I knew did integrative or environmental medicine. So I have a long track record of doing this for like humanity. I have no interest in uh, bettering myself through this meeting. The idea is we see, those of us who are environmentally sensitive or have an idea about environmental medicine, we see what's going on on the island, but people on the island don't see it. So we're trying to bridge that gap by opening lines of communication because traditional physicians have a lot of difficulty learning new material and it seems so scary. But really this is dysautonomia and hormone insufficiency are traditional medical problems. I'm also vice chairman of an integrative medicine consortium and representing thousands of practitioners and I'm on a round table at NIH on building and health and I'm the government liaison for the Academy of Environmental Medicine. And we had this meeting called the CDC's National Conversation on Chemicals and Public Health and there we uh, passed a resolution that said we need to look at mold exposure causing autism and other neurologic problems in pregnant mothers. We've seen many people who are in a moldy house, got pregnant, produced an autistic child, and in fact there was a case in Manhattan Beach where the mom uh, had won four million dollars based on moldy wood from Crenshaw Lumber being sold to the family for building a house. And she produced an autistic child. So lawsuits will often lead the way for change. Uh, and in terms of this mold issue, it's going to be probably the way it's going to go with litigation. Um, let's see. So if you understand the chemically sensitive, the severe patients, some of which you know are here, uh, moderately severe, um, you understand how it's mildly in a lot of people, especially a majority of women over 40. It's so common. Almost everybody you know is sensitive to perfume, detergent out of the grocery store, the tags itch the back of their shirt, they don't really want to fly uh, and taxi behind a jet. They can smell jet fuel or they'll be anxious on an airplane driving behind a diesel vehicle on the, high, on the, on the road here. But sometimes doctors are a little bit too cynical and they label patients mentally ill when they can't figure out what's going on and the patient is struggling to speak normally or to function well. So I was taught in med school to believe the patient, no matter how incredible their story is. And this is, I went to Cornell Med School. So they wrote up my story and they titled it, uh, Believe the Patient. And a lot of other magazines and newspapers have written up my story. And basically the summary of what happened to me is that I was an emergency physician. I did general surgery for a couple of years, then I did emergency medicine, wore a lot of perfume, bought a house in Los Angeles, the mold, the mold in the aquarium shed, which was 5,000 gallons of water, was connected to our house, and the air got pumped in and made the owner of the house before us sick and crazy, and then we became sick. So the dog, my husband and I, all developed adrenal failure, Addison's disease. The males, the dog was a male too, got it about two, two years later than I did. I got muscle weakness that wasn't fixed by treating just the adrenal failure, and I had a biopsy, and it said I was dying from mitochondrial damage on electron microscopy. So I had no oxygen getting to the cells, and the arms and legs were very dark, and I knew I was gonna die. It was told to me by a neurologist that I probably had early Lou Gehrig's, and it's been 14 years, and I didn't die yet. Yeah, well, okay. I never heard of this in med school, but basically my point is that med school education has to change. Doctors in various communities can make that happen, but, but like if the island got their head around what's going on here from, let's say, toxicity in the homes, then maybe it would be easier for Harvard Medical School to teach this in the first year. And looking at chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and chemical sensitivity as the hallmark conditions that we're really discussing. So everybody's on a scale of one to 10, nobody's a zero in terms of being affected by their environment. It's how you react. And as I was in perfume, 
I didn't know I was chemically sensitive. So I had no idea that if I avoided diesel, my muscles would be stronger. I had no tools. And in fact, 5% of the population is disabled from being chemically sensitive, but it's completely denied. 15% have symptoms of chemical sensitivity, and 40% of the population has mild symptoms. That's 75 million people. One third of the patients, I mentioned, have electrical intolerance. These are studies that were done in the country by the government showing that 15% of the population is chemically sensitive. Many, many studies have been done. So when somebody says, where's the data? There, is, there are tens of thousands of articles on all aspects of dysautonomia, environmental exposure, chemical sensitivity. But the average doctor in the office doesn't read this research and just sees the patients and doesn't really know what to do. If you were deployed in the Gulf War, your incidence is 30%. If you were non-deployed veteran, it's 15%. Elderly patients, 30%. Younger people, 15%. This is a study done in waiting rooms of family practice uh, practitioners. 20% of the, pi the population that walked into the office filled out this questionnaire on insensitivity that's been validated, and they were chemically sensitive 20% of the time. Also, it was associated with panic and generalized anxiety, as well as alcohol abuse. So what I'm saying is that sometimes the patients won't realize they're sensitive, but if the adrenals are damaged, it's been talked about since the 60s, that they have a problem with sugar metabolism, because hydrocortisone makes sugar available. And if your cortisol isn't high enough, you can crave alcohol as a quick sugar, and keep drinking because you don't have the hydrocortisone. <coughs> This is my view of environmental medicine, the umbrella over everything else. And we should be looking at uh, traditional medicine as the crux of the umbrella, the handle. But all these other branches of medicine are valid. And what we call it doesn't really matter if it's environmental medicine or something else. I won't go into the detail of history, but Dr. Wrinkle in the 40s sort of discovered the whole thing with food allergy. And then Dr. Randolph is the father of environmental medicine and he treated Dr. Bill Ray, and Dr. Bill Ray is still alive in Dallas, Texas, and he treated me. He's treated 35,000 people with this syndrome, and then some of us actually go back to work, become productive members of society, and then try to explain it to everybody else. So I said that it's not really just about environmental exposure. You can get turned off if you hear the word environmental. It's really a study of the chronic effect of daily exposures and not uh, acute poisonings, which we do acknowledge in environmental medicine, I mean, in emergency medicine. So I'm just gonna discuss a couple of symptoms before we break and hear from other people. The, pe the people on the island that may have symptoms or your wife or your mother may notice muscle weakness, depression, headaches, fatigue, memory loss is really big in a moldy home or moldy <coughs> environment. And uh, when you stand, this anxiety can occur. You can get skin rashes, you can you become sensitive to lotions, foods, and medications. Anesthesia can make you sick for months and maybe make you chemically sensitive if you can't handle it. Sensitivity to cats, down feathers, uh, increased sense of smell. In fact, when you're chemically sensitive and you breathe in diesel or you breathe in perfume or you shake somebody's hand with cologne on it, you can taste it on your tongue for some reason and it goes right into the frontal lobes when you uh, breathe in a chemical. There's no blood-brain barrier between the olfactory nerves and the frontal lobes, so you can get an emotional reaction. So people can immediately change their behavior. And Doris Rapp is very famous. She says, what did somebody eat, touch, or smell before they have a behavioral change? And you can sometimes attribute something and then avoid that thing, whether it's gluten or whether it's ice cream, something else. Um, the other thing that's pretty interesting is that the bras become too tight to wear for women. The tissues are so hypoxic that anything that constricts, like rolling up your sleeve, is painful, and they'll stop wearing a bra for years because they can't handle it cutting off the blood supply to the skin. Sore throat in the morning, reddened face like an alcoholic, but not everybody with a red face drinks. Sometimes it's general toxicity, and I explained that the toxic effect on the face is representing what's happening on the in the brain. So the person may not be able to think clearly or be irrational, and especially somebody with a very red face. Luckily today, nobody has a red face, that's good. 
Okay, my husband has them. He's a redhead. <laughs> they can um, like to sleep with a window open. And I was going to title my book either uh, Sleeping with a Window Open. My mother likes to sleep with a window open, of course. And uh, most people deny that they're chemically sensitive because they don't realize. So they did a study on spinal fluid on chemically sensitive people and Gulf War vets, and they proved the spinal fluid is completely different. Abnormal proteins that are never found in normal people, 10 of them, in these patients. So it has been proven, we're not going to spinal tap all of them, though. So when somebody in the hospital denies that this is true, the data is against that. This is a very good study that was just done by Dr. Brewer. He's infectious disease. He had chronic fatigue patients and tested a couple hundred, 100 people, and 93% had positive mold toxins in the urine. So when somebody has chronic fatigue, he's realized that think mold first. This is a person who had a skin rash, total body exfoliation, losing the skin due to mold exposure, called an autoimmune disease called pemphigus foliaceus. We won't go into all the mechanisms of mold exposure and the damage it causes. We've discussed some of these already, and I want to mention that the spec scan of the brain will change, and there may be a picture of a spec scan. This is the total environmental load, air, food, and water. So the treatment is fixing these exposures. If somebody is toxic and sick, you put them in a clean environment, you give them glass bottled water without plastic and no chlorine, and you give them good quality filtered air. So you turn on a charcoal air filter, and they eat organic food without pesticide. The pollutant load causes both the endocrine system and the autonomic nervous system to be damaged. So what I'm saying has been in the literature for decades. I did not draw this drawing, <laughs> somebody else did. So this is a capillary at the bottom, and people get this damage to the capillaries so that the exchange of oxygen isn't adequate. The treatment, therefore, is giving oxygen. And you measure a venous blood gas without a tourniquet and determine who is toxic, who would benefit from oxygen, and it fixes the swollen, damaged cells of the blood vessels. I already told my story, and I think this is the Thurman article that uh, proved that rats become uh, very sick in a moldy environment. So my theory is that opiate addiction on Martha's Vineyard may be related to environmental exposure in some of these kids. We're all exposed to things. We all have issues, more so in communities where they have moldy buildings. So if people are born in a house with a musty basement, or their mother grew up in a house with a musty basement, and that's the uterus that they're bathed in, they may have symptoms of being environmentally ill. And then if they work in a building like a courthouse or a police station, they may get worse. And this is a very fascinating graph of what your cortisol should look like if it's normal. It's high in the morning. I wonder if I can show. Yeah, it's high in the morning to make you happy and get out of bed, and then drops down throughout the day, and it's zero at midnight. This is a normal cortisol graph of a healthy person. And this is the graph of somebody with adrenal failure. The morning cortisol is so low, the person can't even rise. They're depressed, they're suicidal potentially, and they feel very weak, and uh, they feel hopeless. If somebody gives them uh, a narcotic, maybe they'll feel better, which is a shame. And this is a patient with Addison's with the purple gums. So you get hyperpigmentation of the gums. It's a classic finding. And this patient had a heart rate of 150 with high mycotoxins, trichocythines, ochratoxin, and aflatoxin that had been there for 10 years. The patient couldn't walk without crutches and had seizures. Okay, so I think I will stop there because I've given you a horror show of patients who are very ill. And I'd like to just have you maybe hear from a couple of people who had uh, symptoms that uh, are similar to what I've been explaining so that you can grasp it. So Victoria sitting here, do you want to talk first for a second? Um, sure. I, I um, actually came to see Lisa about, oh, eight years ago, I'd say. Um, because I had uh, chronic Lyme disease and the symptoms weren't going away and I had uh, mold exposure from going into clients' homes who lived in old homes with the uh, sheetrock, some of which was covered with the dark stachybotrys mold. And I was getting more and more tired. I experienced uh, muscle weakness. Um, if I climbed to the top of, of my stairs at home, by the time I got to the top, my heart was racing, even though I always considered myself physically fit and athletic. Um, I had a lot of fatigue in the morning, could barely drag myself out of bed, 
and I was wondering what's going on here. You know, I'm a, I'm a fit person. I've always, I've never struggled with depression, but to me, when you can barely get through your de day and you have, you know, ongoing aches and pains, that is depression. So it was very difficult for me to rise and and, um, and work with the clients that I have. So I, I came to see Lisa, and Lisa put me on a, a wonderful regime. Uh, I did some IV therapies. Um, I was treated with Cortef. Um, I was treated with Midadrine and a few other things that I continue to be on um, several uh, several supplements. Um, although over the years I've weaned myself off the, um, the Cortef and Midadrine, uh, and I'm feeling much better. But I have to be careful. I have to be very uh, very hyper diligent because I don't want to slide back into uh, you know. And, and the, the fact that, that I was if I can interrupt it, mm -hmm. a lot of times the patient's adrenal gland will come back. If you rest it by giving hydrocortisone for a couple of months or a couple of years, they won't be Addisonian for life. And then the other issue is that young people, do you want to comment on anybody young you know that's had any issues? Well, my son, um, after my, um, my partner died uh, about eight years ago, he developed chemical dependency. He was smoking marijuana, and, um, and now he's having issues with oxycodone. And I'm not sure. Uh, he, I took him to see you, and and you, you were going to prescribe the same wonderful regime that had helped me in the past. But he's still in the very resistant uh, phase and and addicted at this point. So I'm hoping over the months to uh, get him on a program because I know it would help. I've seen it help other people, not only myself, but um, a handful of people that I know on the island who've um, seen you for treatment. And and that's the. The interesting thing is how many teenagers in my small practice that I've seen with dysautonomia and adrenal insufficiency, but they're hard to engage when they're between you know, 17 to 21. They just want to have everything fast. They want one pill, it's going to fix everything. And usually if you put them on Minadrine and they had been on Adderall, immediately you can convert them because they don't need speed. They don't need it for vasoconstriction. The midadrine is a drug that does not go into the brain, and it just does vasoconstriction of the legs, so that you immediately feel like the legs are light, you can walk around, you can think, and you have to take it every four hours, but it's, a, it's really a thing that can save them, and then they have to do sauna and detoxify so they can get off the midadrine, so they won't need drugs you know, at all, hopefully in the future. Uh, anybody else want to make a comment? How about Marsha? Oh, me next. <laughs> Well, my story is I was uh, working somewhere, which happened to be the hospital, <laughs> um, and I had had a temporary job, then took another job when that job was over, and then I got the original job back, but the office had moved to a different space in the old part of the hospital, and I was affected by the space, and it was having memory issues, and they let me go. And lucky for me, because I wouldn't have been seeking treatment, but in looking for work, I found Dr. Naj and was treated, became a patient when she hired me. She said, oh, I can see you've got some memory issues, but I can help you with that. <laughs> and within a month and a half, two months, I felt like myself again. So it was a really lucky thing for me. That's the quick version. Thanks. Yeah. And Chris? Um, so I um, came in here about um, mid, mid to early May. Um, and I've, I have uh, kind of a rough couple of months um, and sort of an increase in um, some stressors in my life. My, both my parents died uh, in the last um, two years and I'm traveling off island every weekend and um, you know, taking care of the estate, and managing um, renovation of my parents' property and selling it. And, um, at some point, something um, sort of gradually built up, and uh, I had a, an enormous amount of swelling. Um, pretty much all of my joints hurt. Um, bottoms of my feet were completely swollen, and it hurt to walk or move or pretty much do anything. Um, and so uh, um, she tested me for pretty sure everything under the sun. Um, I, um, I, get, I had a positive Lyme test uh, and a number of other things were low, mostly low, not high. Um, and so then I've, I've been on 
treatment since about the middle of May, um, and I'm feeling more comfortable, um, able to walk a lot more, uh, riding my bicycle more, um, just more comfortable in general. Um, I'm not sure what might have brought this on, um, and I'm looking at that. I did just buy a house, um, and it had not been lived in for a dozen years. Um, so it could be that um, there's something in the house. I haven't been able to quite figure out where that environmental stressor might have come from. Thanks. And Adam, you want to say anything? Yeah. Um, my issues with chemical sensitivity. And you can speak up because the microphone's here, so okay. it. Yeah. My issues with chemical sensitivity began in childhood. I lived in a basement bedroom for eight years as a child. So I guess that's an example. My parents were aware of the mold, but they didn't really realize that it, it could be dangerous and that it could lead to a lifetime of issues. It, we, we just didn't know. I mean, I didn't know because I was eight years old, but anyway, so, so I lived in that moldy basement bedroom for about eight years. And then I, since then I've had sort of low grade chronic symptoms. Um, and then I also had a buildup of, of heavy metals in my system I've discovered recently. But then the, the thing, the sort of straw that broke the camel's back was my wife and I had hardwood floors put in on one floor of our house a year and a half ago. And the polyurethane, I had a really bad reaction to that. And so um, by December of last year, or this last January, I was pretty much in crisis, and I started getting treatment here. And um, with the treatment, I'm feeling a lot better. I'm definitely a success story. Um, I do have dysautonomia, and I've been treating that with hormone therapy. Um, and then I've been doing allergy shots, and I've been doing um, getting rid of the, the mold that was built up in my system and the metals through IVs and through um, sauna. And how long, how long did it take you to, did you improve at the beginning or how long has it been? Well, it took a number of months. First month was pretty tough. <laughs> but then it, once I stuck with the, the treatment, I have gradually, little by little, felt better. And now you can see he bikes with oxygen in the morning and does sauna, and he is tremendously fit. And yeah. He came in very weak you know, various other issues. And, yeah, um, if you saw me six months ago, you might, you barely recognize me. I mean, I was just a different person. And some people will have blood clots when they, um, you know, they'll clot, they'll have heart attack, stroke, um, they can clot a, a, a DVT and, and present with a, like thickened blood from inflammation. And the average environmental patient, if you put them in a clean room, actually the DVT will start to clear up even without thinning the blood. And then Jerry's the last person I think that wants to say something. So yeah. if you have any comment, or you don't have to say something. No, 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 no. I want to say something. I. Um, <coughs> maybe I can say something. <laughs> um, I think my husband, Preston, was Lisa's first patient, and uh, that was a long time ago. And I, I don't know how long I've been a patient, but uh, uh, it's amazing what she can do and we're talking about traditional medicine and I had the experience that my physician here Preston was in the hospital we were sitting there and this doctor came in and said to me said to both of us didn't ask how he was feeling I mean he's in the hospital for goodness sakes you know you're his doctor you come in and you say you two have to make a decision it's either Dr. Naj or me I said, what? And he said, you just have to make a decision. I can't work with her. And um, so he left, and then he came back the next day, and he said, have you made a decision? And I said, no. He said, I'm concerned with getting my husband well and out of the hospital. 
Well, I had made my decision and I did leave him and fortunately found another doctor who was willing to learn something. You know, this is what drives me crazy. This doctor was not willing to admit that there was something he didn't know. You know, and that to me is just, I don't want him treating me, you know. Um, anyway, uh, at least it keeps me going. It's just unbelievable. You know, uh, I don't see her for months occasionally, you know, and, and then I come in and, and they're just, well, you know, you need to do this and this and this. And I said, okay, you know. Um, I had surgery two years ago for diverticulitis. Lisa sent me up with my little letter to tell the anesthesiologist and the surgeon, you know, that I needed cortisol. And so they, gave me the cortisol during the surgery. Well, I didn't get better. And um, they were just scratching their heads. They couldn't figure out what, what was causing me to be, I mean, they even took the nurse off the floor and put her in the room with me. I said, you know, what's happening to your other patients? And she <laughs> said, they'll take care of the other nurses will cover. But anyway, they came, the whole team came in one morning and they said, oh, you know, Maybe she needs some cortisol. I said, yes! <laughs> you know? And they gave me the cortisol and I immediately turned the corner and, and was better. So now I wear a bracelet <laughs> so that that won't happen again. <laughs> yeah, just for today, right? Right. <laughs> no, I've worn it for over a year now. I, I, uh, I, uh, I thought, you know, I'm not going to have that happen again. My daughter was there, my niece was there. But they didn't know. I hadn't told them. They were giving me my cortisol by mouth, but it just wasn't enough. And so, anyway, that's my story. Uh, uh, I was living in a moldy house, and we tried to do, we did put in new floors and clean the basement, and uh, then sold the house to Wes and Lisa. <laughs> and they, they finished the job. But uh, anyway. Um, I can't say enough. Uh, I have two grandchildren on the island. One is bipolar. One has um, Asperger's. Uh, well, the one with bipolar has moved off island, but the one with Asperger's is here. He's a student at the high school, and he hasn't been going to school. And, uh, you know, I can't. I'm taking this home and giving it to my daughter in law. <laughs> because maybe she'll see. Well, the, can I interrupt and make a comment? So the, uh, in a textbook on environmental medicine, the top of the pyramid of an untreated patient is bipolar. So not everybody becomes bipolar, but when you see somebody bipolar, you think, what did they get affected by? So it's genes plus their environment. Sometimes they'll have a cation transport problem and a, you know, an issue with sodium potassium ATPase, and sometimes it's just moldy house, and they get exposed to things and they become loquacious and then more, more manic over the years. So sometimes people, like relatives, won't listen if you try to explain that you could fix a child who has either Asperger's, maybe autism, or maybe bipolar illness. But you definitely want to look at the psychiatric cases and try to figure out which people could benefit. And it's less expensive to put everybody on medication, but there was one, um, closing comment I wanted to make about McLean Hospital. The Shattuck Lecture at the Medical Society from 1890 was about neurasthenia and how people with fatigue and neurasthenia who couldn't get up and do anything would be admitted to McLean and the chairman of psychiatry there wrote this paper and it was all about the treatment of neurasthenia and it was basically environmental medicine. He would put people in a clean environment, give them sunshine, give them good nutrition, they didn't have oxygen tanks back then, so they didn't do O2, and patients got better just by living in a clean way, maybe taking them out of their environment. So 130 years ago, they were writing about environmental medicine at McLean. But now, if you try to engage people at McLean, everybody is so sure they know everything, they're not even looking back at the roots of what some of the big thinkers were saying way back then. So anyway, I'm hoping that there are some questions from you guys to us before we run off and have our day and that we've 
inspired you to think about something new. Let me just ask if they have any questions for you. Do you guys have any thoughts about you know any of this information? Because the schools, the buildings, the hospital had a mold issue. Um, I guess for 30 years, way before I came along, and I did a grand rounds there on mold, and a lot of the doctors are affected <coughs> by mold in that wing of the hospital. Hence, maybe sometimes they're not as pleasant as they should be, and it could be healthier. But um, you know, this hits home in everybody's situation, whether you're in one facility or another. So I didn't know if it, you know you know that there have been issues with teachers or students at the school. I don't know personally what the issues are, but these are the ways I want you to think about the roof that's leaking. Who's been sick? Any comments? Um, I yeah. Um, I think it's an it's important you know issue um, to the environment, and we at the school, um, particularly the high school, are doing a, a, a full battery of tests in the environment, um, the air quality, mold, water, um, to make sure that it, it is um, you know it is a safe environment. Um, because I, I agree with you, it's it's important. It's very important. So I don't know if kids, I know there was a kindergarten once where, you know, the carpet was moldy and a lot of the kids weren't doing well. I don't know if there have been issues at the high school, but if people aren't doing well, I'm saying that you should be reaching out to physicians like me and then I can point you in the direction of who measures VOCs for mold, regular volatile organic compounds, how do you do water testing, national testing labs is the lab that we use that tests pesticides and everything else. Um, and so as patients, and physicians, we already know what to do. Sometimes when you hire people from like the state, apparently the guy who's in charge of mold in the public health department is a lawyer. He doesn't really have any background in mold. And he's very nice, his name is Mike Feeney. And you can't get them to do mold testing on a hospital or a school or whatever. He says, we just look for water intrusion and fix it. But you'll never fix buildings and get a normal mold count. So their advice is don't test. And I would say, you know, I would do some testing and do cultures and get genus and species so you know if you have toxigenic molds and then measure the toxins and then figure out what to do. Because the truth is but more important than, uh, you know, and let the chips fall where they may. If the building's not good and we have to do something about it, then letting everybody get sick. Because when you get sick with your MS or Lou Gehrig's, you won't be too happy if it's you. You know, it's different when it's other people. But when it hits home, and probably all of us have mold exposure. Any thoughts from anybody else? It's a good subject. It, you know, there's a lot that we don't know about when it comes to medicine. I think nationally and as a culture and as a civilization, we're behind on a lot of issues. But there it is. Music therapy, art, sound, massage, Reiki. There's a whole host of things that we don't really embrace very well. So this is part of it. And uh, there's a huge void in uh, what we get paid to do versus what might be able to help us. And energy medicine. So, it, so I mean, I, I can appreciate this, and I think we have a lot to this discussion. So, so energy medicine is probably going to be the wave of the future because energy is effect. You know, a lot of us have toxic issues, and if there was a cheap, quick energy method that worked to make you feel better, that would be nice. But what I used to say is, that if you can't prove to payers like insurance companies that you can't, that you can't, you got to be able to cure some people take bad disability, bad neurologic disease, fix some people, then they will pay for the treatment. Because you may spend an extra five to $20,000 up front as opposed to paying for chemo for three cancers and neurologic disease, they cover that. Now the problem is, is that they don't realize they could treat uh, effectively. And my feeling is that integrative treatments sometimes are expensive and don't get you to the place of cure. So when I talk about massage or craniosacral, I do believe that there are things that are useful, but they won't necessarily cure the patient. If the patient's in a moldy environment, let's say, they keep going back to it, it's still going to kill them or you know, make them sick. No matter how many times they go off island to, I mean, go to a practitioner for a little help, it'll make them feel better, but it won't fix the problem. So I feel like the crux is in taking a good environmental history. When did you get sick? What changed? Did you get a new job or a new home? Adam, did you have another comment? Yeah, just from the point of view of, of the individual patient, which is what I am, um, when you're environmentally sick, it, you feel really awful, both mentally and physically, and it can feel like a death sentence. But the good news is, and I'm thinking partly of my father, who um, 
I think now, having met you, I think was, he was chemically sensitive. He, but he was also bipolar, and he committed suicide in 1980. Um, but he didn't know, none of us knew about the, this whole issue. Now I'm learning about it, thankfully. And, and that's really my point is, once you figure out what it is, the underlying issue, and you get treatment for it, you can get better. Right. And you don't really need drugs, and you can actually stop the supplements. I tell them one year of supplements, and then you're probably off. You know. Yeah, and I think it's important to test our, our homes to give us peace of mind. I work at the uh, Council on Aging building down on Dock Street, Negra Town, which is subject to a lot of um, offshore winds and rain and some water intrusion. It's an older building. So I ordered uh, the little mold plates, the Petri dishes, and you had given me the link on where I could obtain P and K them. microbiology is where you can send and them. I did. They're no longer actually providing a, a, a report or advice. They just send you um, the levels, and right. then you have to uh, determine on your own research what those levels mean. So I, when I tested um, the Anchors building, um, it reflected a high level of penicillium, which was a concern in my office area. So fortunately, the, step, the town um, stepped immediately in and um, you know, it improved the environment, treated it with bleach, removed old wood, repainted the office with a non-toxic paint, and then I retested and the levels had gone down. So now I do have a peace of mind that I'm in a safer environment. And, and also in a building that I won't name on the island, I've seen people who've had cancers that are directly related in the literature <coughs> to mold exposure, where they've glossed over it, they've painted over it, left it there, everybody's breathing it in, and then one person gets a disease, one another person gets cancer, they kind of push them aside, but don't really ever fix the leaky roof which is not only you know, an immoral thing, but not to heed after somebody or a group of women, usually it's the women that complain and the men, until they get sick, they don't, they don't believe the women. So we have to really realize that the women are the canaries and we're gonna get, you know, we're gonna warn you guys about what's really going on sometimes and then if you don't listen to us, it'll get you later. <laughs> but, I think you know, proper you know. remediation is important too. Yeah. Like you say, it's, it's not a, a sufficient just to put a little bleach on some of the surfaces and paint over it. You have to have, <coughs> excuse me, someone knowledgeable in the field actually go out and do an assessment yeah. and do it correctly. Otherwise, um, just putting a band-aid on right. a problem is going to And some buildings are, end up getting demolished if <laughs> they can't be approved. But I think that the relationship to the opioid addiction issue is really clear. And although we're finished now, the page after page one here is uh, something that I found interesting in the literature. I just copied one article for Ray um, that they acknowledged that problems with the autonomic nervous system and the adrenal and the production of cortisol, whether it's high or, or low, have been shown to exist in, pe in people who have addiction issues. So I'm not the first one to think of this, but if you want to know about what practitioners think when they see people with addiction, this is what we see in integrative medicine day in and day out. It wouldn't just be me. There are probably 10,000 doctors in the country that it would agree with these findings if they know about, let's say, dysautonomia. And I would suggest that at the school, the school nurse could just do standing heart rates on the kids and document if the heart rate is greater than 20 beats when they're standing versus lying, then maybe we should um, be pointing them in the direction of a dysautonomia expert. And that would be a first thing. If, if your heartbeat changes 30 beats, it's significant for dysautonomia. And we'll see how common it is by studying here. And even the doctors at the hospital could do standing and lying heart rates. Psychiatrists should be doing the same thing. So if we screen at least for dysautonomia with a simple technique, we would find so many more patients who may then need a questionnaire for environmental sensitivity and exposure. Anyway, thank you very much for everybody being here and speaking up. I'll see you later.